everyone and welcome to the Miss Saye Show. Today, in honor of the Black History Month, we have one of the Black community leaders, Garen Flowers, successful and eligible bachelor. Uh, here he is on the show with us. Welcome to the show, Garen. So good to see you again. Always good to see you. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you for making time. I, I never can Absolutely. get enough of you. So uh, I'm so glad that you agreed to come back on a show and talk a little bit more about you. Of course, I've done a lot <laughs> since we last spoke. So do uh, tell. Lots to, lot to dive into. <laughs> do tell. I know you had your show on CB, CBS, CBS, ABC. I was a- I'm so sorry, a- ABC, the uh-huh. show Bachelorette on ABC, which I enjoyed very much. We definitely left an impression. Uh, Did you watch? You watched? I watched, I, as I mentioned to you, I watched a dodgeball very carefully. And I watched- I not, <laughs> I, not too carefully. <laughs> I, <laughs> I think you were, you definitely uh, raised the bar, I would say at dodgeball outside of the court uh, and um, inside of the court as well. And also what I loved about you because uh, you have a media background, you were so comfortable and you, you just made it more uh, joyful to watch for me personally. Maybe uh, it's because you. I'm biased and I love you. But <laughs> That means the world. I appreciate that. Uh, you, you are always too kind and, and so nice. So I appreciate you. Do tell. So whatever you can share with us. I know maybe there are some red tapes, but I would like to get a little scoop of how was it? How was the Black... Uh, media representation in the Hollywood level, like in uh, on the set of a bachelor with everybody else. How was that? Well, you know, the franchise has been on for a very long time and there's been some criticism in the past that there hasn't been enough um, representation with people of color. And, um, you know, I've seen certain seasons where there were um, a decent amount of men of color um, buying for the bachelorette. So that made me feel more comfortable going on the show. And then going into this process, the producers were very upfront with me about how they wanted to, you know, have more representation and they wanted to see, you know, a person of color find, you know, go for love. So um, I felt very comfortable going into the process and being there, I definitely felt comfortable and um, I'm glad that that showed on camera. Definitely. You're definitely brave. You know, Um, I know how we could be pigeonholed and like be, they put you in a box or you can do certain thing. When I started acting, it was the same thing. The same roles you will go out for. And then they would say, okay, we want to add some flavors. (laughs) Maybe we can just bring you in as a token. So uh, it takes a lot of courage for you to, uh, I don't know, I think you applied or did you submit yourself and they chose you? Yeah, I I ended up submitting myself and they ended up picking me up, which was incredible. I never thought that I would have the opportunity to go on a show like this. I didn't know that I was the caliber of guy they were looking for. And that was my bad for thinking that I wasn't, you know, that the caliber worthy guy because they they saw it. And so I'm glad that I did apply. And um, yeah, it it definitely helped boost my confidence being able to uh, go through this experience. Garen? caliber worthy are you kidding me <laughs> uh, you are teaching at usc even at your rival right. I mean, you are you're all around successful bright excellent right. attitude handsome what is caliber worthy like you are a caliber <laughs> that's what i Thank that's you. what i would say so i'm so Thank glad you. that someone like you went on that show and uh you know and it seemed like you you got a rose the, the first mm-hmm. couple of nights you did get a rose so yep. how was that with your other uh, was the competitions or other gentlemen that were on the show? How was that? Yeah, it, it, you know, it was difficult at first. You walk in and you see these uh, tall, good looking guys, very fit, great careers, you know, a doctor, a couple, few lawyers, uh, lots of business owners, uh, uh, some financial guys. I mean, you, you had the, the creme de la creme, the, some of the most amazing men you'll find in this country were all in one room going after the same woman. So that was very intimidating, you know, but at the end of the day, you know that they brought you there for a reason and that the woman is going to connect with who she connects with. And the only thing you can control is being the best version of yourself. So that was the one thing I told myself was be the best version of yourself, version of yourself, 
and you can't lose. There's no way you can go wrong. Um, and that's the only way you'll fail is if you don't be yourself, you know? Um, yeah, so that was, that was cool. And then um, The Bachelor is airing right now. And there's this scene where one of the women kind of gets lightheaded and starts to black out a little bit. And I completely feel her pain because those rose ceremonies are long and intense. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, you don't, things, things are edited well, so you don't know what people go through in those times, in those moments. Oh, well, thank you for talking about that. Yeah, because I would have totally missed that. It feels it moves really quick, um, but it seems like there's a lot of things happening in between. Um, so I watched one of your interviews or we were speaking. You said you walked out of this experience of being on Bachelorette with new perception on love. Could you elaborate on that? What is that and what did you gain? And I'd like to hear that. Yeah, I really, I really enjoyed this question. So I would say before going through this process, it was a little bit more difficult for me to be vulnerable first. You know, I would always sort of wait for the woman to be vulnerable, wait for the person I was dating or going after or in a relationship with to say the things that, I wanted to say, you know, how much I enjoy them or how much I love them or appreciate them, you know, and I've always been the one to wait to hear things first before being vulnerable and opening up. And this process really taught me that it's okay to, as a man, to uh, emote and to tell a woman how you feel. So that has allowed me to be a better person, I think, with just people in general. So that's one thing. Another thing is the level of romanticism. I mean, when Claire would walk into the room, we would stand up because we thought she was so beautiful. And um, the things that we did, I mean, the effort and the level of attention I put into impressing her was like, wow, I've never done this for a woman before. So I was like, if I'm willing to do this for a woman on this TV show, why wouldn't I do that for a deserving woman off of camera? So Um, It's definitely upped my game as far as like how I treat a woman. And then lastly, just um, being raw and vulnerable, kind of like the first thing I said, just being raw, vulnerable, open and, and knowing that love is love can be a fairy tale. Yeah. Yes. I I hear you. And I'm glad that you have walked out with some valuable information or growth, personal growth Mm -hmm. from the show. That's Mm -hmm. a very positive outlook that you have. So, um, and also I listened to you that you mentioned that usually when, after you go through this process, love is usually around the corner and, uh, it could happen. Yeah. So anything has happened since then? Just like- <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a great question. Uh, well, I, I was, I was sort of dating someone for a little bit after the show and, um, you know, it, it was kind of moving a little fast. And so, um, she decided to like slow it down a bit, but, um, so right now I'm, I'm pretty single and just now taking my time and, you know, not rushing anything. So we'll see what happens, but I'm, I'm open and available. <laughs> Thank you for sharing the, your personal life with us here. Um, I'd like to talk about your work a little bit more as a content creator and media professional. Um, how do you see the African-American representation in media across the board uh, beside the show that you were on? Well, this is such an important topic. I, I think that it could be way better. Um, mm-hmm. I worked in local news for seven and a half years. And when I graduated college and graduate school, I told myself, I'm not gonna have any issues getting a job because there's barely any black men in local news. Like I would apply to different TV stations. There'd be a a group of 10 to 20 reporters and it didn't matter what station. I mean, it could be a big station or a small TV station in a small city uh, or a big TV station in a big city. And it would be 10 to 20 to 30 reporters there will be no more than three black guys, if, le- if not less. Sometimes I would see two, sometimes I would see one, sometimes I would see zero. And that really alarmed me and bothered me. 
And it didn't help my chances with finding jobs, which alarmed me even. I was like, there's no black male representation here or very little. Why, why is it so hard for me to find a job here? I know that I'm good at what I do. So it was very alarming when I first started my career. I noticed it right away. And throughout my career, it was very easy for me to be the only black male reporter at my station. So seven years later, are things better? I hope. Um, I haven't really looked at, at the news world as much, but um, I hope that it's better. And I know it needs to continue to get better. I know it can't be what it needs to be. And the importance of having people of different races, ethnicities, backgrounds, is you can relate to people better in different communities. You know what I mean? So um, there were certain stories that I was able to connect with or information I was able to um, share with this news station that people of different backgrounds might not know. Um, so it needs to be better. That's my experience in local news, but there could be better representation across the media landscape as a, as a, toll, as a, as a whole in entertainment, and news and cable news across the board. Very well. Um, I hear you. I mean, it's a representation of uh, America. If you're a melting pot, Los Angeles, New York, you see, you know, people of, from different backgrounds working in every area of life. You see, when you go on the street, you just look around and what, that's what you want to see um, around the table for negotiation, in your Congress, uh, everywhere, I, I, because we have different perceptions, we have different experiences, as you said. So I understand the importance of that. In your opinion, how could, how could we help? How could we help uh, balance that a little bit more and harmonize it so we can see more of a, a colored man and woman all working alongside in a more balanced way rather than as you say, two reporters or zero re uh, black reporters? Well, this is the first step is having conversations about it. So I appreciate you bringing up this topic and having me on. People don't think about it. You know, people who aren't a certain race or color or whatever don't think, oh, we're lacking this. You know, some people might, but a lot of people don't. And that's the important thing is like, hey, you're lacking this. You have to fill, you have to fill this gap, this, this void. And um, I think not only do you have to fill those gaps, but also like, give people of color more opportunities. You know, I think it's easy to put, you know, just like a white person in like positions of leadership, I think, which is partly privilege. So, you know, consider African-Americans or people of other, you know, races and ethnicities in positions of power and in positions of more, um, foresight, you know? So yeah, I, I just, I think it just needs to be a stronger conversation and to actively do your part to notice when things could be better. You know what I mean? So it's all about educating yourself and then you'll know that like, Hey, we could sure. do better with this situation. Sure. Sure. Thank you for talking about this, speaking up and seeing like all of us can do something. We can make some sort of a choice to mm. advance this. I, I completely agree with you. For example, if I am making a film and uh, I, read, I read the script and I see when it's, and you did that with your interview, um, like, we, uh, or when you look at the breakdown, it says policeman. We need a policeman, male, white, 19 years old to like, I don't know, 35 years old. Right. Right. Or uh, certain jobs are seen as this is a male job, like a little riddle that right. you did that you were talking about surgeon. Yeah. And when you were thinking, everybody was like, well, nobody was thinking a surgeon could be also a woman because you associate that uh, with it more. And um, like one thing that I know there's a software that this uh, wonderful act actress, um, uh, she has an institution she made that analyzes the movie and it tells you in the movie how much screen times a male get how much screen times a female get how much screen times a colored person get how much screen times a white person will get and it analyzes and it does literally break it down as a privilege as you described because even sometimes when a colored person talking or a woman is talking they cut the camera to the white person 
well, but you can still hear her voice. That means that they, and what you see is what you believe. So when you keep watching that, when you keep watching it, your eyes are more familiar with seeing more white male in these uh, characters or as a CEO of a company or as a policeman in the movies. And you're seeing them more often that you see the colored person and a woman in that, the same role, then uh, that's what you believe. You think that's the normal. And to break that, I guess it takes some training, mental training. You have to be conscious of that. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. And I love technology. I love that people are so innovative and creative and come up with things like that because it's, it'd be hard to quantify that and to put down on paper what the film industry, how the film industry divvies up time based on gender, based on race, you know what I mean? Based on color. So um, that's, that's really fascinating. And what you were referring to earlier was nominated story about gender bias in the workplace. And that was such a fascinating, just like, science project, I'll call it, because, you know, it was crazy to see how people automatically assumed this, I, I gave this riddle. And yeah, tell me about the riddle. Tell, t- tell me the riddle. Yeah, I, I can't really remember it off the top of my head, but basically it's like a father and a son are in a car crash and they go to the hospital and the doctor says, I can't operate that on that boy. That boy is my son. And people did not understand that the doctor could be the wife, could be the mom. This, it was a surgeon, not doctor. Surgeon, surgeon, surgeon yes. Surgeon. People mm-hmm. associate surgeon with male. So people were like, was it God? Was the surgeon God? Was the surgeon Oh gosh. Yeah. A, a, another father? Was it like two men? You know, was it like people didn't understand that it, the surgeon could be the mom. Sure. You know, uh, there was no point in that riddle that says the surgeon was a he. Yeah. So it was a fascinating story and it, it got nominated for an Emmy and it just like exposed how we all have these preconceived notions about things. Yeah, that is incredible how you got those people thinking. I watched it and I enjoyed it. I, you know, it. I, I am married to a surgeon. You know, oh. surgeons do a great job um, sewing the holes in your socks because mm-hmm. that's what I have assigned to my husband. He sews all the holes in my socks. He does such a wonderful job. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's such a great husbandly thing to do. Yes. <laughs> um, well, I, 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 would, I would love to ask you a question as someone who's married, you know, what are your thoughts on fairy tales and romance and all that coming from, you know, watching a show like The Bachelorette? Oh, you're turning it around? Yeah. All right, it's okay, Garen. <laughs> <laughs> I love you so much. Um, you know, I, we have recently got married and we, uh, someone once told me, uh, fairy tales could not be true, but love stories are true and you make your own love story. Um, in my case, I did have the fairy tale. It has been incredible. And I literally manifested, we both manifested each other in our, each other's life. And, um, you know, people fall in love differently, but for me, when you know, you know, we both knew and we both moved really fast, uh, really, really fast. So some, like you were experiencing that you had to slow down with the previous experience you had. We moved really fast because we knew and we moved forward. And um, definitely marriage is something special and to be cherished because uh, it definitely, even that it's COVID and we had to do it uh, very private. It was literally four of us. It was me, my husband, Sir Richard Branson, his wife, uh, and, uh, and in his island. And um, it was very intimate. But even after that ceremony, even that it was so small, it felt just more beautiful. It felt like you feel like a new person. If refresh button for, you know, I just felt really good. We both felt really, really good. My husband couldn't sleep till three in the morning. He was up like his eyes were wide, like did it just happen? It seems like a fairy tale. I was like, yes, it did happen. <laughs> but um, it's challenging. And uh, I asked everybody around me before I got married. I said, what is your, you know, what is your advice? What is your advice? And um, as Sir Richard Branson, he was, he wrote a beautiful piece and he was reading to us. He said, it comes with lots of patience and work and you have to work at it every day. So it, it's not going to be easy. And if you have marital problem or you have something to discuss with your partner, but you put that at the end of your list. So you attend to that right before you go to bed, when you already 
take care of everything else business wise. And then you're like, Hey, honey, I actually wanted to talk to you about this and this when you guys are both emotionally not as, um, you know, uh, it's end of the night. So you're tired. That tells you where you are setting your priorities versus if you in the first thing in the morning before you go to work, leave a note and say, I know I have to talk to you about this. I know we still have to discuss this. You're important to me. Let's talk about it. Let's make an appointment to talk about this. So you just prioritizing, prioritizing your husband, your wife or your husband's feelings. I think that's very important. I love all of that. That <laughs> all was incredible and amazing. I'm so glad I asked you that. Uh, I mean, I'm so happy for you that, you know, you could have a love that you deserve and that is beautiful. And it's amazing that you had your fairy tale story, but you also are keeping it real and saying like, it's work, it's not easy. And it takes time and patience and hard work, you know? So, I mean, that that's exactly what I'm looking for is that is, you know, a fairy tale story that's beautiful, but also I know that it won't be easy and will take, you know, lots of work. So that's amazing. Well, thank you so much. I look forward to one day you share your uh, love story and marriage with me, hopefully soon, okay. whenever you're ready. Okay. Hopefully. Um, I would like to also ask you about your transition. You said you were working, working in the local media state, uh, local news, and then your transition to where you are and in more in a Hollywood level and you're living in Los Angeles. Could you tell me more about that? Absolutely. So, you know, when I got into news, I knew that I always would be open to doing entertainment. Uh, and when I mean entertainment, I mean like hosting, uh, red carpet interviews, right. um, interviewing celebrities, um, hosting competition shows or game shows. I remember when I was a reporter, I used to watch The Voice and I used to love that show so much, so, so much. And I was like, man, how awesome would it be to host a show like this? This would be a dream come true. And so that's why I ended up moving out here. I enjoyed, for the most part, my, my time in news. It wasn't easy. It was, it was a lot of rough days. But, you know, I, I had a passion for it. And that was that. You know, I did that. And I had some great friends who reminded me that news wasn't the end of my story, that that wasn't the end of my career and, and what I would spend the rest of my life doing. And they reminded me that I enjoy talking to people and and entertainment and pop culture. So I quit my job, not quit, but my contract ran out and just decided not to go for any other jobs or to try to stay there and moved to LA without a job. You know, I, I jumped in head first and kind of like how you said, you know, you know, when it comes to love, it, that's how it was with my career. It's like, when you know, you know, I knew it was the right move. Ooh. I knew that I would regret not moving out here. And I think okay. I chose the best time. I wasn't a young whippersnapper, but I also wasn't like, you know, too old to move to Hollywood. And um, it just was the best decision I've ever made. I, I'm so happy I made this decision. Now I have multiple jobs, you know, I'm teaching at USC, mm -hmm. uh, uh, TV host for Cinemark theaters, uh, interviewing celeb the actors and actresses and helping promote their movies. I host a concert series out here when there's not a pandemic. And um, I'm just doing some amazing work that I'm just in love with. In love oh, with. so good to hear that. So good to hear I'm doing some amazing work that I'm in love with. Uh, in honor of the Black History Month, who are your uh, role models, the people you look up for, look up to, um, they could be alive, they could be not alive. Uh, who are the people you have looked up to? Yeah, um, this is this is so tough because there's so many amazing um, trailblazers who have uh, paved a way for me and, and, and my fellow brothers and sisters. Um, I'd have to say Ed Bradley from 60 Minutes, um, absolutely incredible storyteller and just like, just smooth, just swagged out. <laughs> um, and I'll stick to 60 Minutes and um, mention one of his former colleagues, Byron Pitts, who's still alive. Byron Pitts is an anchor for ABC News. 
I think for Nightline, he, I think for Nightline, he's an anchor and he's an incredible spirit. I mean, one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet and has just mm-hmm. been huge in my career and uh, has given me great advice. And I remember reading his book before I met him. And so I was just like starstruck. Ooh. So he's a great guy, uh, Byron Pitts. So yeah, Ed Bradley, Byron Pitts. Um, and these people are in media because your aspiration was to be become yes. successful in media. And you know what? In a way, uh, Garen, you are a trailblazer. You you look up to them and there will be other people who are looking up to you. I'm sure you're a student at USC. You're also uh, in, inspiring others. So it's good to have you on the show. Uh, right. I'm so grateful for your time. It's always fun to have you. And um, I wish you luck in your uh, romantic uh, (laughs) segment of your life and every other areas. And I hope to see you again on the show soon. Uh, You are seriously the best. You are an amazing soul. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you so much. Love you. I appreciate you. Thank you, Garen. Thank you.